Hi everyone. Uh, sorry, it's been a little while since I've done a live stream, so I'm just trying to get everything set up. But if you can <coughs> hear me uh, or see me, uh, please put something in the chat box. Maybe um, who you are and where you are and um, where you're coming from. I'm Anthony, Dr. Anthony Wellen. I'm the career doctor. Some of you know me on YouTube. Um, some of you know me uh, from Facebook. Uh, you know, there was a bit of discussion over the weekend about how um, how you guys can all get prepared for the possibility that there might be, uh, I guess, a bit of a, a need for uh, additional workforce shortly uh, in Australia. Um, so, uh, and how to find jobs and, and where they might be. So, uh, I've put together. Um, a quick presentation for you guys just to remind you of some of this stuff. So again, if you can see this and hear me, um, put, please put a message in the Facebook chat or the or on the YouTube so that I know that you are seeing this. See, there's a couple of people watching. So. I'll just wait for a few others. Um, if someone can put something in the chat box, that'd be great. Thanks, Sean. Okay. So um, obviously I'm recording this as well um, and I'll put it up a bit later, but uh, I just wanted to orientate some of you guys. Maybe some of you have seen a few of my videos, maybe not, um, uh, to some of the things that you should be thinking about if you're preparing for applying for a job uh, in Australia this year as a doctor. I guess largely this is going to be targeted around doctors who might be on what's called the standard pathway uh, for working as a doctor under general registration here in Australia. But a lot of this will also apply if you're a specialist IMG uh, or coming through the competent authority pathway as well, say from the UK, Canada, US, Ireland, etc. cetera. Um, I guess one of the interesting things at the moment is, you know, with all the borders being locked down, there are going to be, there are doctors in Australia um, who currently aren't registered, who have got their degrees from elsewhere and maybe going through some of those processes and thinking about what are the, the opportunities um, that might be presenting themselves over the next little while. Um, so um, what I'd like to cover today for you guys, uh, and please you know, send me through your questions, comments, queries, um, at any point in time, there's uh, the chat box on Facebook as well as on, on YouTube. Um, maybe just let me know who you are, where you're from, uh, where you're up to in the process. You know, are you um, an IMG that's going through the AMC? If so, have you, you done your part one or part two? Um, are you a specialist IMG? Are you in Australia? Uh, are you outside of Australia at the moment? How are things going for you? Are you staying safe? That sort of thing. Um, so what I'd like to go over today with you guys is firstly, I've had quite a few questions about where, uh, you know, where should I be looking for jobs? Where will, where are they? Where will they be? So we're going to go over a little bit about that, um, just to go over some of the key things that you should be thinking about. And I think maybe some of the tactics and strategies probably change at the moment in terms of where it's uh, most efficient to be looking. Um, and then the, the thing is, I think at the moment, you know, there's still not a lot of job opportunities out there in Australia for uh, international medical graduates, uh, but I expect there will be quite a few more in the next few months, um, and maybe there'll be different types of opportunities. Um, and so uh, what I want you to know is what are the things you can be doing now to get ready for these opportunities? What should you be thinking about? In particular making sure you have the right documents ready to go um, when a job opportunity presents itself, uh, as well as how can you be ready in case there's an interview that comes up. And those interviews might uh, might come up 
um, very quickly, those opportunities. I mean, they, they, they generally tend to come up very quickly anyway, uh, but uh, I would suspect that, again, it's, it's going to be one of those situations where you might lodge an application or maybe an EOI, an expression of interest, um, and then maybe you don't hear for a while and then there's this rush thing where you get contacted and all of a sudden they want you to be on the phone tomorrow or available for a video interview tomorrow. And so you need to be prepared for that. You don't want to be in that situation where uh, I guess you're uh, thinking, oh my goodness, oh, I've got an interview tomorrow. I haven't prepared for that. Um, what's this technology? I'm not used to using video, uh, those sort of things. So there, there are things that you could be doing now that are going to put you, in my opinion, in a much better stead for when potentially some of these opportunities present themselves. Um, and so I'm, on, I'm going to do a bit of like future casting, predicting of what I think is going to happen. You know, please don't take any of this as, you know, official or definitely going to happen. Don't rely on it. But like, I think we need to be thinking about how things might be changing over the next few months um, uh, and thinking strategically and tactically in relation to those sort of things. Uh, and obviously, um, you know, once we go through the presentation, um, I'll stay on the line for a bit of a QA and a afterwards. Although, as I said, if you've got questions at any point in time that come up, please stick them in the chat box. I've got a little um, app over here that I'm trying to look at at the same time as concentrating on the actual presentation. Uh, I'm going to tr maybe try and hop to the internet at one point, um, which... <laughs> Switching over can be a bit of fun, uh, but I'm pretty much going to stay on the slides so I can sort of concentrate on what I want to get across to you guys as concepts uh, and also attend to any questions that you might have. So, uh, thanks Vinod uh, and welcome. So, welcome Sean and Vinod. Um, great to have you on board. So, um, before we get into the talk, uh, I just wanted to let you know that at Advanced Med, um, which is a very small business is basically me and a few other people that help out from time to time. Um, you know, our mission is to help you in your medical career and, and help you get the sort of jobs in medicine that you want. And we obviously work with consultants, trainee doctors in Australia, but also um, a large number of the people that, that seek out help from me are obviously international medical graduates. And I'm really um, grateful that you put your trust in me. We do have you covered with some of these things. So if you're wanting um, some additional help, I uh, would we'll just highlight that we've got uh, currently courses about um, the, how to put your cover letter in and do your job application as well as how to get prepared for your interview. That interview skills course has got all my core teaching in it, all the stuff that I do in my coaching with one-on-one -on -one clients. Um, and it's a super good way to get prepared in my opinion. So I would recommend them to you. And whilst this um, recording is going, there's actually an offer uh, out um, where you can pick up those courses for a, a discount of $200 in, com in combination. So normally I do them for $397. Um, they're now available for $197 for a limited time. Um, we do also do you know, coaching and help with resumes and things like that. I'm going to come back to that at the end because um, I just, uh, you know, it's going to be important for me to point out to you guys how much availability I'm going to have um, over the next period in, in terms of my thinking about future casting. Um, so, whilst, you know, those services are available as well, I would point you back to the courses because they're probably going to be things that I can maintain. Um, and as I said, there's an offer there for you. But let's let's get into the the discussion and we can come back and maybe you've got some questions towards the end where you want to ask what's in the course um what do you get out of it that sort of thing that's fine by me so firstly how is the system responding to covid19 in australia well look um i have a bit of insight into that i'm involved in health services and involved in my local medical school with medical students there's a lot happening at the moment to get us prepared you know, we're, we're ramping up things in Australia um, from a country perspective. The health system is ramping up. We've had some good news about some tests coming through, more test kits and more PPE gear, which is great. But all the hospitals are preparing for a surge at the moment. Um, and so what we've seen, similar to other countries, is um, things being cancelled, training being cancelled, placements for students particularly being cancelled or paused, um, exams being put on hold. These are all important things to be doing now to provide a bit of 
room to cope with what's coming, but they do have flow on and knocked on consequences. And in other countries, uh, you know, like the UK, they're asking retired doctors to come back in. That's starting to happen in Australia. Um, there's talk of, and there's actually examples in other countries of medical students already being repurposed for roles. And those sort of discussions are ha being happening now in Australia. So we're thinking about, um, you know, how are we going to sustain the clinical health workforce? And obviously this is happening also in other, um, you know, health professions, particularly nursing at the moment. So um, it looks like someone might have just purchased a course. So great, good on you for that. Um so, uh, you yeah, know, these things are happening and people are thinking about where is the extra workforce coming from? Estimates are somewhere between they're going to be at any point in time when we're in the midst of the, um, the full on effect of COVID, maybe anywhere between 20 to 30 percent of the actual workforce being off sick or isolating because they have COVID-19. Um, and that's going to place a lot of strain on, on the system. And, you know, let's hope it doesn't happen and come to the point where we actually have also deaths amongst or se severe illness around the workforce but um, we're going to have to temporarily or permanently replace some of that um, and I just think at a certain point in time people are going to wake up to the fact that there is a large group of IMG workforce here in Australia that have gone through some of the exams and processes and are really uh, looking for opportunities and yeah look um, uh, it's about working in the hospitals and there's a risk in doing that um, but uh, so I think some of you guys are going to be, you know, keen to help out as well in any way, shape or form, maybe as a doctor or maybe in one of these kind of pre-intern roles that they're talking about for medical students in some way. Uh, and I just see that that's going to happen at some point. Haven't seen a lot of activity around it yet, but I think people will start to think about that. The, those in um, uh, the, inf the official positions will start to contemplate this. Uh, and so I posted a video a couple and a post a couple of weeks ago about this, you know, why aren't we using the thousands or so of IMG doctors that are currently sitting here in Australia who've been applying for jobs. Uh, in many cases, you know, have gone through both aims. Um, to, me, I'm just going to turn my phone off, uh, to just thinking about them as also additional helpful workforce. Um, and there are probably opportunities there already. Um, just on that point, uh, I'll come to this when we go over the resume, but uh, often one of the things that uh, I talk to um, uh, IMGs about when they're asking me, how can I advance my resume, particularly when I'm applying, you know, what can I do? One question, I, one of the first questions I often ask is, well, you've been, so let's say you've been in Australia for a couple of years working through, say, the AMC process. What have you been doing in that time? And often I find out that people have been working in other areas, but they haven't put it on their resume because they think that's a negative. Well, first thing, that's not a negative. Any work you do in Australia is a positive, actually, for most employers. You know, the fact that you can hold a job, work in a team, you know, understand uh, what work is like in Australia is actually a positive. Um, and I often recommend to people, go and look for, you know, quasi health roles if you can um, whilst you're trying to get a job. So things like phlebotomists and things. Well, there are opportunities presenting now. Uh, hey, Wasi, nice to see you. Um, and thank you that you can see and, and hear me. That's great. Um, so look, you know, there's going to be probably more opportunities in the sort of quasi medical area, you know, like um, helping out on uh, health lines, or maybe they're going to put calls out for additional people to come in and work as uh, porters and, you know, in those sort of um, uh, support roles in hospitals. So be thinking about those as well as opportunities. Um, if you can demonstrate that you've worked within a healthcare setting, that's going to really be helpful for your future. So that's that's something that you kind of want to think about too. Um, but let's, let's talk about where you should be looking. Um, and one of the, the general mistakes um, I think that um, people make is, and hey, hey there, Deepu, uh, nice, nice for you to join us. Um, sorry, someone keeps trying to ring me here and um, I'm just going to, I don't know how to turn the, I've got it on silent, uh, but it keeps coming through on the computer here. Um, so one of the things to that we generally talk about, sorry, is 
when you're looking for a job, um, maybe online's not the best way to go about it. Sure, you should be watching the online sites and things like the, the various jobs boards, uh, but really the way that most IMGs, particularly those on the standard pathway, generally tend to get their first opportunity in Australia is through networking, by making personal contact, by going out to places, going to conferences, you know, finding a doctor who knows another doctor in an area that can help them, that sort of thing. The personal networking approach uh, is usually the way that most people sort of get their foothold um, in terms of a job in Australia because it's just so competitive generally. Um, you know, when a job comes up for a resident level position, there's usually maybe even 100 applications from IMGs that are at least eligible based on the basic criteria for that role. I think that might switch a bit. You know, I think there's probably going to be a few more opportunities to be looking online. And so I think being aware of what's online is going to be even more important. And obviously getting out and networking is going to be a lot harder with all the social distancing measures. So that's probably the, the, a key change. In terms of where you should be looking for, um, go and look at all the state and territory jobs boards. Um, uh, again, this is going to be a little bit tricky if... Um, uh, you know, because we've, we've got border control within Australia as well. But uh, I, I think that's not going to be a huge problem if you get interviewed for a job and they can get you on board in another state. Probably there's going to be some mechanism for you to move if that's required. Um, but definitely look at those jobs boards. Um, have a look at what's available. Um, uh, also be looking at some of the aggregator boards, particularly SEEK. Uh, and make sure you're looking for this key phrase, eligible for registration. I talk about this a lot. Um, but there are so many jobs that get posted where they don't want to receive applications from international medical graduates. Um, and so the, the main reason for that is usually the market is such that there's enough uh, doctors out there already who already have gen registration, some of whom will have been IMGs who've gone through the system, obviously, but most of them will be Australian and in some cases New Zealand trained doctors have got their general registration through the Australian system um, and they're looking to recruit from that pool first. And by law, also, uh, all jobs in Australia, not just medical jobs, but all jobs in Australia do need to go to Australian citizens or permanent residents first if they are suitable for that role. So in a lot of cases, most of the jobs that get posted are just uh, not available to apply to for international medical graduates. So it makes sense to actually filter, try and filter those out um, and get down to the ones where um, they are open to the idea of looking at an applicant who's um, internationally trained. And the key phrase generally is this one about eligible for registration because you'll see um, on a lot of these jobs, they will say one of the criteria in the selection criteria um, and by the way, they, a good way of kind of skipping through is to actually don't read the whole job description. Go down to the selection criteria and check this out first. There's usually the first criteria says something about must have a medical degree and then they'll talk about your registration status. Um, it'll often say medical degree with general registration. Uh, and so what they're saying is you must have general registration now already. There will be a few, though, uh, that say uh, must have a medical degree and be eligible for registration. And these are the ones where there may be an opportunity, and there is an opportunity for international medical graduates um, to apply for. And I, I, I'll see if there's any questions around that. Anyone, does that, is that clear? Am I making myself clear in terms of that? Maybe you might have had some experiences where you've, I don't know, applied for different jobs and maybe you put one in for one where it was about general registration, you didn't hear back, or you kind of got halfway through the process and... Then they told you, sorry, we, we can't accept you because you're not registered. Has anyone had that sort of experience? Uh, yeah, meet. Uh, so you've had that experience where you kind of applied and they were interested and then they found out you didn't have the appropriate registration. Is that what happened? Um, yeah, so yeah, so that, that's, that happens a bit. Now, look, there, to, to give you the full picture, um, you know, sometimes employers will post jobs where they say must have general registration. And sometimes people apply for them without general registration and sometimes they get considered anyway. It shouldn't happen that way. It should be clear and transparent and you should be able to find the jobs that you can apply for, but uh, occasionally it does go that way around. So, you know, 
it might be worth putting in applications for some of those other posts. But there are so many of them uh, and the likelihood of you being considered for them generally is, is low. Now, I think you will start to see a lot more on these particularly resident medical officer jobs, this eligible for registration um, criteria, which will give big, give big signal to you that, um, that maybe they will accept your application, at least consider you. So that's what you should be targeting in on. I would suggest that if you haven't already registered with those state and territory jobs boards, um, you know, most of them have a process where you can, uh, you set up a user profile and you can set up email alerts for certain jobs. Go in and do that. Make sure that you're getting alerts of particularly the resident medical officer type uh, level jobs coming from those boards. But also go to SEEK. Um, I've proven this myself. Um, uh, so you can register with SEEK and they tend to aggregate all these jobs from around the country as well as ones from private employers. Um and, uh, you know, private hospitals, that sort of thing, even general practice jobs sometimes. Uh, again, set on the appropriate filters, make sure you've selected for eligible for registration and set up some alerts around there. Now, I get an email alert from Seek um, once a week on this one, I think. Uh, and I don't always look at it. Um, but when I go in, probably maybe, you know, there might be 10 jobs where there's this eligible for registration, maybe one or two are actually suitable. So that's pretty good yield. The other ones tend to be maybe at a high level for a specialist or um, maybe sometimes you get a non-medical job, obviously. Um, and you just have to watch out for sometimes the recruitment companies also post and they kind of, sometimes they've got genuine opportunities, sometimes they're just fishing to increase their candidacy pool. But I reckon that's a smart tactic um, to have that set for SEEK, that you're getting emails about any medical job where the key phrase eligible for registration is, and that'll alert you to additional opportunities. Um, any questions about that so far? Cool. All right. Well, there is a bit of a delay, so um, I'll keep watching the chat box and, and see how we go. Um, so, you know, thanks everyone for joining me. Uh, I've got quite a few online now. Um, thanks, Sean. Thanks, Vinod. Thanks, Wazi. Thanks, Deepu. Thanks, Meet. Um, thanks for thanks for taking the time uh, to during the day to join on the on the live stream. Um, so, this is a current job uh, that is live on the New South Wales JMO uh, recruit page. Um, just Google New South Wales JMO e recruit and I'll pop up. Um, when I looked this morning, I think there were four resident medical officer jobs. Uh, this is the only one currently, uh, which has this, um, you should be able to see that, uh, eligible for registration. So this is an example of the sort of, oops, excuse me, the sort of job um, that you should be targeting, okay? As I said, start at the top, look at the position, and cycle out down the bottom. The New South Wales jobs, I guess, partly I'm most familiar with them because I'm in New South Wales. Uh, I do think they're probably the best, <laughs> the best uh, jobs board to look at the, in terms of ease of understanding what's looked for. Um, and uh, what you can do is quickly. This is the bottom bit. Slip down to the bottom where the selection criteria easily uh, highlight it and just check them. Um, um, and so that is a job um, in Lismore at the moment where they would be um, open to offers. Um, a question from Vinod. Usually are we eligible for registrar and training positions with just part one in English? I would, as I said, I would start off targeting the resident jobs. Um, sometimes there might be a senior resident level job and bearing in mind in some states and territories they use different terminology like house officer is the other one. Um, in say Queensland, um, the further you go up, the less likely they are to accept someone. It, it will depend on your background um, because remember they have to provide you with quite a lot of supervision in this first year. Uh, it has to mirror the intern experience, but please don't see this as an intern job. Intern jobs are pretty much uh, out of contention for international medical job, uh, graduates in Australia. You need to be targeting the next level up, the resident medical officer roles. Um, so, yes, sometimes you can get like an unaccredited trainee or a senior resident job, particularly, you know, if it's an area that you've got skills and experiences in, 
Uh, and look, if there is something available that you can grab that they, they feel that you're suitable for, get it. Um, a problem with doing some of those stream roles, though, is that you have to demonstrate back to the medical board that you've done the general mix of experience, enough medicine, surgery, emergency medicine in particular, during that 12 months of supervision for them to sign you off. So that can be a little bit of a problem if, say, you're employed, at, say, in a psychiatry senior resident role. Um, now, sometimes the hospitals will swap you around to help you with that. They're usually pretty generous around that. Again, I think with COVID, don't expect that at the moment because what's seeming to happen at the moment is everyone is being the sort of rot normal rotating thing that happens for trainee doctors but is kind of being reconsidered at the moment in terms of is that the best thing to do? Is that the safest thing to do? Let's get doctors trained up in their roles where they are and maybe keep them in place. So it may be harder to swap around over the next 12 months. So hopefully that, that answers. But yes, um, the, the minimum requirements for applying for these jobs is to have your satisfactory level of English proficiency, which um, there are four options for that. If it's the IELTS, we're talking about at least seven in all the four bands, uh, plus your AMC part one. That's the, um, the key bits. Now, um, in previous videos and on blog posts, I've talked about how um, it's important uh, to think about improving your uh, English proficiency score. Uh, a lot of the time, I see people say to me, but I'm eligible because the medical board says a seven overall is okay. Well, that's the minimum. I can tell you what the employers look at is for better than that. The minimum standard is generally interpreted as borderline in terms of your ability to transfer into the workplace. And it may even be seen as more risky to employ someone with a overall seven at the moment. Um, than it possibly is generally. So if you can do a little bit better, even if it's like a couple of 7.5s or you know, you've got, you're doing the OET and you've got 1A and 3Bs, that is generally interpreted as you having more advanced um, general communication skills. And remember, they haven't spoken to you yet. They are looking at what's on paper, okay? So, you know, if you've, you know, some of these tests are available online, um, uh, some of you might be needing to renew them. Uh, it's, you know, if you're, I guess, looking for something to do to fill in, if you may be isolating or whatever, maybe practice your English a bit more. There's, there's another tip. Um, get your score up is a real top tip. Um, so question from Danushka. Uh, the OAT expired a few months ago uh, and the exam stopped. Look, I, yes, I don't know about any of that. Um, Maybe someone else can write in the comments or chats. That, so there's the um, the IELTS, the OET, the PTE, and the TOEFL. Um, maybe other people have some uh, understanding about which which of any of those are still operating. Um, I'm not surprised the OETs expired because there's uh, that's an in-person, uh, partly in-person exam, isn't it? So that's going to be a little bit difficult to run. Um, I would think, from my knowledge of how IELTS works, it's probably going to still be possible to do that online. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, it'd be interesting how that works, but if there is an opportunity for you to improve your English score, and obviously if it's expired, you need to re-demonstrate it anyway, um, I'd strongly suggest that as something that you can do. So hopefully that's, um, that's clear. And maybe someone's got some advice from those watching about what's actually possible at the moment. Um... Okay, so that's an example from New South Wales. That was the only one I could find with a brief search this morning of a job that's available. So as I said, there's not any real concrete signals at the moment that the hospitals, as far as I can see, are opening up their thoughts to um, employing more IMG workforce than they would normally do at this point in time. Uh, however, I did notice that on the Queensland jobs website, they now have a broad expression of interest um, happening. Uh, but you'll notice here that um, this is, uh, oh, sorry, this is a, um, uh, you know, I think this is antip anticipation of the need to employ more doctors uh, just across the, the the landscape of Queensland. But you'll notice that you currently need to have your current registration with the Medical Board of Australia. I would watch this one and I, I presume probably other jobs boards are going to put something like this up as well. Um, I've kind of advocated previously for something like this um, 
uh, for international medical graduates um, in states like New South Wales, but um, it's failed to kind of sell people on the idea, I guess. But um, I'd be watching something like that to see whether the criteria change over time because it might just alter to looking at um, people that need assistance with registration. Um, and look, there's also discussions happening with um, the medical board at the moment in terms of, you know, streamlining processes and getting people re-registered, that sort of thing. Uh, I noticed, I heard in the UK that they actually offered a whole bunch of retired doctors free re-registration um, just to get them back on board. And I think that was the same with nurses in the UK. So you might see things like that. Um, on the flip side, obviously, even the medical board is now having to think about sending people home to work and that's going to make processing things difficult. I think a lot of their stuff um, under APRA is all electronic anyway, so it should be possible to reconfigure that. But, you know, um, they do a really key role, APRA and the medical board, and uh, if you are kind of progressing registration um, through them, just be patient um, uh, and understand that they're probably working under difficult circumstances right now as well. Um, so... Uh, Deepu, um, a question, uh, working in obstetrics and gynecology with three years experience, planning for the specialist pathway down the line, um, should I only apply for jobs with specialists as obs and gynae? Look, um, Deepu, I think uh, I, what I'd recommend is that you book one of my strategy calls and we can go through that. There are some issues particularly with the uh, College of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology in terms of what they will um, except in terms of experience and particularly length of training that you need to kind of go through. Um, so I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Um, you know, possibly you could certainly apply for general jobs at the moment. Um, but again, I don't know where you are in terms of progressing things through like the AMC, etc. cetera. Um, so, you yeah, know, go have a look at some of my videos on the specialist pathway. Um, and then maybe book a strategy call with me because, um, what I tend to find with pretty much everyone, actually, everyone's different, everyone's unique. Uh, I get like a question which leads to another question which leads to another question. Inevitably, it's better for me to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and go through things and explain things to you, take you through websites, they take you through information, give you full clarity of the picture that, you know, so you can make key decisions. So um, I'm not trying to obfuscate here at all. Uh, I like to give as much free advice as I can, but at a certain point, you know, it's quite intense. Um, and so that's why I recommend a, a paid strategy call for those sort of things. Um, Danushka, uh, anything that you can suggest to show we are improving English at the moment? Yeah, look, uh, it's a really good question. Um, uh, I think a bunch of things. So um, why don't we just park that for a second? Just so, so wait with me, we'll get to the appropriate point and we'll talk about it then. Um, I'll just quickly show you. So seek, this is what I'm talking about here. Um, uh, you know, plug in eligible for registration, make sure you've got the filter for healthcare and medical. You can even go down a little bit further than that, but you can see you can sign in and register for alerts, etc. as well. Um, so that's the main aggregator side. That's the only one I really look at other than the, the um, state and territory jobs boards, really, when people are asking me to sort of see if there's a job available. Um, so let's just talk about your documents and, and this is where I'll come back to, um, English, um, probably on the next slide, Dunushka, so remind me if I don't talk about, it. um, so your key documents are generally things around cover letters, um, apply online. It's not really a document, but you have to put content into the application, um, and your resumes. And obviously, of course, you also need to have referees lined up. So, um, a key thing I find, lots of people contact me about help with a cover letter. Uh, and inevitably what I come back to them with is that actually most of the time the employers don't want a cover letter. Uh, if you go to the New South Wales website, it actually explicitly says don't upload a cover letter. And the reason for that is the second thing. So, you know, medicine is a, and health is behind the times a bit in industries, but we do have e-recruitment portals. We do have jobs boards. Um, a lot of these jobs boards have changed the need for a cover letter. So in the old days, jobs were advertised in a thing called the newspaper. 
uh, and there was a mailing address. And the, they had, they're quite big ads that have all the selection criteria and what they're looking for. And so you had to write a letter, you had to type it up or write it, um, and send it into the mailing address. And it took time, obviously. And that was about you. They needed that in information from you um, in order to see whether you met the criteria so that they could then decide whether they wanted to interview you or bring you in for an interview. So, you know, the processes were much more, um, you know, elongated and, and, and strung out, etc. Well, nowadays, um, that thing about justifying the selection criteria in the cover letter is not necessary. Now, some places still do this and it's a bit silly, but and they even might require a two-page letter justifying the criteria. Fine, if they specifically ask you for that, write one. Um, but in many cases, you're actually better off focusing your efforts on getting your examples and justifications for criteria correct for the online application. It's the same thing, okay? And then your resume. Your resume just wants to stand out, particularly that first page. I can't emphasize that enough. You want to put all the information that the employer wants to see quickly in their six to eight second look on the front page of your resume. Don't worry so much about a cover letter. Um, I'll show you shortly that. In fact, I think it's the next slide. Yeah. So I did a video about only five sentences that you might need for not a cover letter, but actually a cover email. Um, so go and have a look at that video if you're looking for some inspiration about cover letters. But um, think about turning into a cover email. Make sure that cover email is personalized. Don't do one of those ones where it's, it's quite clear that you're, the employer's on a blind copy list and you're phishing. Make sure you've looked up about the hospital and found out something about it and that you are genuinely applying. Um, and that, that suits whether there is a job open or... Um, often, sometimes you might just be sending your resume in to see if there's a job, and that's fine. Either way, I would suggest a, a brief, succinct, personalized email attaching your lovely resume to it as a way of connecting with employers. And only do a cover letter if you, if you need to, um, if they specifically ask you to. For the applications, um, you can, you know, look at those jobs that are available now. Um, it's surprisingly how common, particularly at the resident medical level, the resident medical officer level, the criteria are the same. So actually meeting those criteria, and in fact, the questions they ask based on those criteria are also fairly common. Uh, they don't vary too much. Um, and uh, I'll probably switch over to the... Uh, the internet in a, in a second, just show you a couple of tips around that. Uh, but you can actually be gen generating um, justifications for the selection criteria right now for some of those things like, you know, um, what's your background, you know, uh, what level of experience do you have, that sort of thing. Um, how have you demonstrated high level communication? How have you demonstrated collaboration with the, within the team? Um, how have you um, contributed to quality improvement? Um, how can you? How do you effectively time manage? How do you uh, work under supervision? All that sort of stuff. You know, you probably only need about twenty different um, paragraphs to meet most of the different selection criteria that they might throw at you. And most of those paragraphs, if they've got good examples in there and good examples of achievements and things that you've done easily also translate through to things that you can say in the interview. So it's worth your time doing that. Finally, additionally, a lot of that content, if you can generate it, will also nicely populate, populate sorry, good stuff to write about yourself in your resume. So it all makes sense to actually have a look at what is the employer wanting? Have a look at some of those job descriptions. Understand those criteria in particular. Um, talk to some of your friends who are working in these roles to find out what the key challenges are as well. And then generate examples that that address how you can meet those criteria. Um, as I said, that will help you with the application, it will help you with your resume, and it'll help you at the interview. Um, so, um, as I said, I've done that video on the, the cover email. Um, applications, know what the common criteria are. As I said, they, they don't change much. Um, a top tip here is... Uh, Keep all that stuff in a Google Doc or a Word Doc because often um, what happens with these online application portals and maybe someone else might have an example of this, um, it, it, they can time out on you. And the, 
the text boxes are a little bit clunky and sometimes slowed up though. So you're much better off generating, taking the headings offline, and putting in it well, in, online into Google Docs or into your Microsoft Word or whatever, and writing out these statements and then copy and pasting in. And then saving that because you'll probably be able to use them again for other jobs. So that's another tip. Um, don't just do them within the online application um, because once they're in, they're kind of gone and forgotten and the next job you apply for, you're going, oh, we should save them. It saves me going through all that again. Um, resumes, and this is where I'll come back to the IELTS question um, from Danushka. Okay, so again, I've done bunches of videos on this and we've got um, uh, we've got a CV service at the moment. Um, I used I did have a resume course. Uh, my plan was to have had that relaunched by now. I maybe hope I can do that in the next month. I just can't promise it. Um, but certainly, um, uh, we have some services there for you. Um, and, but there are also blog posts and, and helpful videos on the Career Doctor channel about this as well. Less is probably going to be more, even more crucially um, in this environment. The emphasis on the front page is even more important. If you don't know what I mean by that, um, understand that for most industries, when they're, particularly when they're looking at bulk applications, particularly if someone's actually a human is actually looking at them still, which happens in health. The first scan is six to eight seconds. That's it, six to eight seconds. Um, you know, and I've, this is based on some pretty good evidence from um, other industries and a, a study that's been repeated a couple of times looking at how recruiters and HR people process and scan resumes. Um, and they were blinded to what they were looking at, so looking at visual scanning. Um, was it replicated in health? No. But when you talk to all the people who work in health, when they talk about annual medical recruitment, when they talk about how they have to process hundreds of resumes and decide who gets moved to the next stage, which is generally the interview stage, yes, they all say they can very quickly, in a matter of a few seconds, work out which resume um, meets the criteria and which doesn't. Um, and often they may not even look at those application criteria, by the way. They might start off with your resume. Um, and then if they seek more information, they might look at your justifications. So it's crucial to get that right. Um, and the thing that they will look at the most is the front page, in particular the top third. Um, and so on that needs to be your name. Please put doctor with your name. Please be confident. Make that the biggest, boldest thing on, on the page. Um, they want to understand a little bit about your years of experience in particular recency of practice. Um, so if you've got good years of experience, if you've recently practiced, make sure that's the first sentence in your personal statement. They want to know what your AMC status is. If they're looking for AMC certificate people only, don't make it hard for them. Um, put that down and um, just bear in mind if you've only got part one, that's how they've chosen, okay? Um, obviously, some things that I'm going to mention here, you do have in your car. You want to emphasize things that are, make you more unique as a candidate. Some of it's very binary. I, I get, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that. Um, if you've got good English proficiency, particularly in the tests, that's a it's it's a proxy measure. Um, then put that down. If you know you've done better than in excess in the, than what's required in the IELTS or the OET, put that down. With the PTE and the TOEFL, by the way, employers understand that less, so they don't know what the baseline score is. So you might have to explain that a bit more uh, if you've done better than that. By the way, in relation to other things that you can do uh, to show that you are a high quality communicator, well. I guess the first thing is have a well-constructed, grammatically correct Australian English written resume would be one thing to think about, okay? Um, make sure that uh, it's reviewed by someone who's a native reader and writer of English. Um, you, don't, uh, you, you don't want it to come across that you've got broken English written communication because, again, that will be seen as Maybe there's an issue here. Maybe you're going to struggle communicating with patients, communicating in the team. Um, so that's probably the next thing, particularly, you know, in terms of trying to get into the interview. Uh, make sure that if you're 
writing uh, application criteria as well or sending in a cover email, make sure you get someone else to review that as well. Uh, one of the things that I, um, I do a little bit for people is help them with their selection criteria statements and, their, and also for specialist IMGs, help them with their applications for the college. Honestly, I think about 50% of that work is correcting grammar and English and making it um, appear more natural. Um, and this is not saying that you can't communicate. It's just uh, there's a certain way that we speak and write and read here in Australia. Um, and if it feels natural to the reader, it's going to be received as, as better communication and, and uh, they're going to feel better about um, reviewing you as an applicant. So that's probably the next thing, getting all your, your documents reviewed from a, a like ease and uh, quality of written communication because, you know, uh, and this, is, this goes for trainee doctors as well, um, Australian doctors. There's nothing worse than a few typos or grammatical errors that just leap out on a resume. Um, for... Good or worse, it's it's perceived as lack of attention to detail. And in medicine, where there are certain situations where we have to get things right, that gives a certain signal to the panel. Um, for that reason, also, I recommend sending your resume in in a PDF format. Um, anyone guess the reason for that? Um, we'll come back to that. Maybe you can guess that. Um, so... Other things you can do about your English, um, I, I think the next thing is actually, uh, you know, like it's going to be assessed at the interview stage anyway, um, and it's going to be implicitly assessed. Um, there's sometimes there's a question about your communication, but obviously you're communicating verbally, so it's it's going to be looked at regardless. Um, and so you want to improve your natural speaking and engagement ability. I come back to the fact that a lot of IMG doctors are kind of head down, uh, focusing on getting through the AMC exams, that sort of thing, um, when you could be out there doing some more networking and particularly maybe even getting some experience working. It doesn't even have to be in the health field, just working in, in a team in Australia um, and familiarising yourself with the sort of communication and improving it naturally. Um, so... I think on a resume, if there's some evidence, it could even be voluntary work. It can be an observership, but um, uh, preferably actually paid work, paid employment, uh, where you can even use the manager as one of your referees, by the way. Um, that's, again, evidence that you're able to communicate in a work environment. So that's good. Uh, like I've had people who've said, oh, I don't really want to put down the fact that I'm a security guard on my resume. And I go, why not? Security guards have to have a high level of skill in terms of customer service. That is what interns and residents do on a daily basis. They have to be customer focused. Patient focused, if you want to call it that, but, or patient centered, but it's about having good empathic communication skills with the patients, the families, and obviously the other members of the team. So um, there are lots of you know service roles where there are communication challenges, um, where if you can show that you've performed in those roles, that actually speaks to your candidacy. Um, so that's probably another thing to consider. As I said, if you've got work experience in Australia, um, that can help a bit because if there's a, re there's a referee on your resume um, who's an Australian manager, then the employer can go and talk to them and find out a bit more as well. Uh, I Some years ago, um, there seemed to be a large number of Bangladeshi doctors who were in Australia who uh, were working as... Um, nurses in sort of aged care facilities and um, I found that very helpful um, uh, because I could ring up the nurse unit manager and get a really good reference from them and invariably I would be told how great a team player they were and um, those doctors actually made really good transitions into the workplace. So there's a few ideas around um, improving English. Does that, does that help you, Danushka? Let me know if there's anything that's not clear about that. Um, just getting back to the why the PDF, by the way, because no one's guessed. Um, if you send in a Word document and someone opens it, there's a few things that I find tricky with Word documents. Um, usually if you've made track changes or things in it, 
uh, you know, sometimes you forget to turn them off or someone can go in and look at them again and you just don't want the comments and the things and the previous edits popping up. Or even if you haven't, um, Word does some funny things in terms of saying certain things are grammatically incorrect, etc. And, you know, you don't want those little blue lines showing up when someone opens it. Um, the PDF doesn't do that. Uh, so it's, it's less obvious that there might be a problem. Okay, so it helps to kind of cover it up. So that's why I said, and you know, no one can edit it as well. Um, so yeah, that's why I recommend always sending the final document in as a PDF format. Um, uh, what else? Yeah, other things to make prominent on your CV. Uh, make it clear what your visa or permanent residency status is as well. Again, this may be a bonus for you or not, but if an employer sees that you're a permanent resident, they know it's going to be a lot easier to put you on. So they don't have to help with all those visa issues and it increases your eligibility status because you know and you're in the same boat as others with permanent residency and Australian citizenship and as I said don't forget to include your other work and um, make sure there's a personal statement there I'm not going to go through what personal statements are um, uh, too much um, that's a whole session of its own. I've got a course and, and other things on that coming, but um, and other videos and blog posts I've done about that. Um, but uh, you know, make sure that the top third of your resume includes something like that, some narrative that talks about you. Hello, Moses. Thanks for joining us. Let us know if you've got any questions at this point. Okay, so last week, I think, <laughs> um, it's been a bit of a whirlwind. Uh, I did a video about the job interview, particularly thinking about the fact that my prediction for 2020 is two, two predictions, actually. Um, firstly, that your next job interview is probably going to be by video, maybe by telephone, probably definitely not in person, okay? Uh, and so you need to actually get better at video interviewing because um, it's going to be seen as a proxy for your ability to work with technology and medicine is embracing more and more technology. Uh, and again, like at Olympic, you might be the most tech savvy person, but if your online video interview comes across poorly and you haven't sorted that out, um, that's going to be seen as maybe you can't cope with the hospital IT system. Um, so go watch that video. I'll, I'll go over a few things about it, but you know, go back and watch that video as well. It's the last one I did, so um, it should be easier, easy to find. Um, other prediction I make though is that this has happened already. Um, uh, employers obviously are switching over to video, you know, we're doing it now. Um, uh, it's happening in my university, it's happening in the health services. Everyone's suddenly realized that you can video conference. Um, and actually there's some advantages around that from an employer point of, point of view. Um, there are systems where you can actually set up the questions in advance. The candidate can, you know, do the interview and then you can watch it later. Um, that's a bit more advanced than probably what's happening at the moment. But even at the barest, uh, having a video platform means that you can, you're can you much easier to schedule interviews because you can just find the time for each panel member to hop in. You can have panel members that don't have to come to a central place to do the interview. The colleges have been doing this for their selection for some while. Um, I'm hearing that for those colleges that are still thinking we need to select people in the training programs for next year, they're going to go to video platforms. Um, it's just going to happen. And once people have understood that this is actually in many ways better, <laughs> they're not going to go back. The systems are, you know, like, so why we would we revert back to the normal when this actually works better for us? A lot of places are going to stick with video post 2020 for their interview process. I guarantee this. Um, and so, as I said, you want to get better at this. You want to become professional at a video interview. And now's the time to get the kind of... Um, Leading start in this, I think there's lots of things that you can do to make you look better from the next person who's interviewing just by doing some basic stuff that's really easy to implement. Um, so as I say, those interviews are likely to be conducted either by phone or online. Um, I think they're likely to be brief. <laughs> um, probably, well... 
probably most of the RMO interviews now for IMGs are really only about 15 minutes anyway, so it's hard to be much briefer than that. Um, they're often, you guys are often offered an interview at a fairly short notice. It might be even briefer for that. So again, really go and, you know, go and go through my interview course now so you're prepared. Um, they are likely to be without much notice. I mean, this happens a bit to me. I get contacted by people saying, oh, I've got an interview tomorrow. Can you help me prepare? Well, yes, I can. I can do a coaching session, but there's only so much we can do in one session. You're much better off investing that time up front. Um, hey, Ahmed, thank you for the, for the comments there. I hope you're finding the, um, the live stream useful. Um, uh, thanks for the, the feedback. It's really, uh, it's just great to get some... <laughs> some uh, response from people and that, I, that this is helping. Um, yeah, look, be prepared for the interview. Um, I read and I, I read somewhere, someone made the analogy that the, the thing about interviews are they're really important. They're important um, skills that you need to have at being able to do an interview. They're pretty similar to those sort of clinical exams you did in medical school. And let's face it, you, most of us, invested a lot of time in those exams, you know, getting, you know, practicing, preparing, anticipating questions, coming across as professional, all that sort of stuff, you, you know, having the right outfit. Well, why would you not do that for a job interview? It's even more crucial, in my opinion. Um, and so preparation is important. But the thing is, for many of us, we kind of, you know, we might, you know, my stage, you got a few years between interviews. So, it doesn't really make sense to be practicing all the time, obviously. So we get that, which means when you're coming up to an interview or anticipating that you're coming up to a time when you might be doing another job interview, you need to re-engage in practice and preparation. It's just going to improve your performance. Um, you know, high-performance athletes engage coaches to give them micro-feedback to improve their performance. If you really want to take it to that level, you need to be thinking about doing those sorts of things. Um, uh and 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 it, but at least preparing and getting some expert advice um rather than i put the application in all of a sudden i've got to run out well you might be just using that as a practice session if you're turning up to the interview without any prep and we did a poll about this um uh and it was surprising how many people how many doctors told me um that you know i think last time i checked it was about 65 percent had either only for their last job interview either prepared the night before or tried to win it. Now, some people can do that, um, but if you if you really want to maximise your chance of success, uh, do some preparation. And, uh, you know, is that unfair? Maybe, but on the flip side, employers are looking to employ candidates who are sincere and put in preparation and are methodical and all those sort of things and see the value of getting feedback and improving their performance. So... Um, it is what it is. Um, know the common questions. Um, I'll show you. Hopefully at the end of this live stream, I can up, switch over to a, the internet. I just don't want to keep hopping between because I don't want to um, make it too complex. Um, but I'll show There is a blog post I wrote with about 16 common RMO questions. And look, I actually go... In my coaching, I go through that blog post with people. And um, invariably, most of the questions they get are variations on any of those. Um, so know the common questions. Common questions that you'll get will be things around how you prepare for this job, how will you deal with the challenges. Be prepared to answer that question. Um, how do you deal with difficult families or you know, an angry boss or something like that? How have you dealt with communication issues in the past? Um, tell us how you would deal with work conflict or, or generally it's actually asked in terms of an example. Um, you know, what, what do you understand your role will be in documenting things? What's important to be documenting? How do you go about doing that? Again, in this, particularly in this era, they're wanting people who are as job ready as possible. Um, so if in your last position in another country, you've worked with electronic medical records and discharge summaries, emphasize that you're able to do all those things, that you're quite good with those systems, that you can learn quickly, that if you've got a question, you usually just turn to your colleague and they help you sort it out within five minutes or you Google it or whatever. Um, show that you're capable of doing those sort of things quickly and speedily. You know, when you're put on for these jobs, yes, there is supervision and we, you know, we take those that are involved in supervising take that responsibility seriously. Um, but the more ready you can present yourself as, 
the more confident they're going to be able to be in terms of thinking about whether they can support you. And in, I don't think I've heard back from any interview at this stage. In fact, most medical interviews, um, there's always some sort of clinical scenario. Um, and this is where I struggle in my training and coaching. Um, being a psychiatrist, <laughs> no one knows every bit of medicine. <laughs> uh, so I can't tell you what the factual answer to every clinical scenario is, but there are common things in those scenarios. And usually it's not about understanding the underlying condition and the management. It's about your process. What would you do? And then recognizing at a certain point that escalation is, needs to be a consideration and thinking about the resources around you. And this is where often IMGs fail on this question when I'm on panels. They can usually talk about when they might ask for help, but they forget that the scenario includes the fact that there's a nurse that's called you and you might be able to get them to help you with certain things. So think about the resources around you to help and think about who's there to come in, who's more senior and um, give you some help around that. Uh, this might be a good time to pause again and say, has anyone had any sort of curveballs around interview questions you want to pitch at me, uh, questions around that. Um, happy to kind of build some of those um, as well. Um, while we're waiting for them to come in, um, just a couple of tips around the phone interview. Um, I was actually coaching someone last night and they said that the interview coming up has switched around to a phone interview. Um, so we actually did coaching in that mode. I normally do it like this, but I turned the cameras off. Um, and actually what I found was it was a bit harder because you have to concentrate and listen to people. When you see them now in video technology, you get most of the body language, which is great. Um, so the answers can sound a little bit longer. Uh, so you have to be even tighter, I think, is one of the, the key things there. But there's a couple of advantages for a phone interview, okay? One, one key advantage is they, can, they can't see you. So you can be doing all manner of things while you're talking and listening to them. Um, they're probably going to ask you to, to um, guarantee there's no one else there with you. Uh, but, um, but other than that, you know, you can have your, your application out, your resume out. You can have your key talking points that you want to get across to them out. And apologies if you can hear barking in the background. Um, actually, I might just quickly unshut my door. Um, yeah, so you can have all your key messages, the key points that you want to get across. And what I actually recommend is you take the selection criteria, put them in one side of a table, and then on the that's your left side. Then on the right side, what are all the examples? You know, you've probably done this from your application already. Things that you want to tell them about you that shows you can demonstrate those criteria. And then you can be marking them off as you go through the interview. So that gives you things to talk about. And then usually at the end, there's some opportunity for you to kind of ask a last question or anything else you want to say. And you can quickly go through that and make sure that you haven't missed anything that you think was crucial for them to know about you. So that's one point. Um, so that, you know, there's advantages there. And I guess the other thing is if you're kind of thinking, what's this question about? You've got the criteria there. You can pause it. You can look at it. And um, you can kind of work out what they're trying to get at. The other thing is, think about, I recommend practicing doing this first if you've got an interview for, by phone. But you can actually put your phone on speaker, um, choose a carpeted room, <laughs> but you can actually stand up and walk around a bit. And neuropsychologically, that's got an advantage. The act of moving engages your brain in a way that you're more creative in your thinking and you're going to be better at answering questions. So, you know, there's there's some advice out there that's a phone interview is probably best to stand up and do a bit of pacing while you're talking. Obviously, don't run around because you'll be puffed and then it'll come across. But, um, you know, there's a couple of tips on the phone interview. Video interview. Look, there's lots to consider with a video interview. And go back and watch that video I did about the video interview with all my tips, including my setup, um, recommendations about how to do that. But probably if I was to distill it down to three key things here, um, three, three, with my... Uh, three key things there here. Um, first is, it is still a face-to-face -face interview, so treat it just like any in-person interview that you might be going to, okay? Uh, dress the same way. Do all the things that you would normally do to prepare um, uh, and get all that right. But then, as part of your practice, practice with the technology. Um, you know, you might be practicing with your technology. I use Zoom. I recommend Zoom. It's a great platform. Lots of people do that. Um, 
but if you can ahead of time, also find out the technology that they use and, and have a play around with that. If they're really switched on, they're going to probably offer you a practice run, um, but at least find out what it is um, and practice with that so you can kind of be quick at getting in, etc. cetera. Um, but practice with technology in general. Um, get professional with your video skills. So lots to consider here, but there's things like um, your lighting. So at the moment I'm sitting here and hopefully you see me quite well because I've got two lights in front of me and nothing at the back that's making shadows, okay? Um, I've got a good webcam. I've got good internet connectivity at the moment, thank thankfully. Uh, thankfully. Uh, thankfully. Um, all that sort of stuff. Um, having a backup plan, like if the internet falls over, well, I'm pretty used to switching over to a 4G hotspot and I've got my phone here ready, you know, to... To use if I need to, um, uh, and to switch over quickly. Um, uh, think about your background. I'm using a green screen at the moment, so that's <laughs> that works for me. But you know, a neutral background, declutter the background. You don't want them staring at things that are distracting in the background. Uh, I had a coaching candidate the other day who had a uh, a light above her that was kind of shining up here and putting a shadow on as well. That was really distracting. Um, so those sort of things are really important. If the more professional you are with your just presence on video, that's just going to affect them. You know, it's the, a lot of, um, there's some science out there or some evidence out there that shows that a lot of employers, maybe up to a third, will make their decision about you within the first 90 seconds. So, if you, so your ability to look professional on the video might be that cut through in terms of the good first impression. Um, Think about your framing. Um, you want to be able to see, I've got not narrow frame because I'm using my green screen, but you want to be able to see the the body language. Um, sorry, I do that there um, all the time. Uh, so probably I would, you know, when I'm normally doing this, I expand out my frame a little bit better, but it's, it needs to be at least to down to this level in terms of your torso. Um, hopefully have a fixed desktop, but make sure that the camera is eye level with you. Um, so it, mine's a little bit above, which is okay. That's all right from a cosmetic point of view, either just a little bit above or at eye level with you. Um, if you've got a laptop, that generally means you need to think about propping it up a little bit. Um, so there's quite a bit to consider there. I've run through most of that stuff, all that stuff really in that video I've done. So, so go and watch that one next. Uh, question from Shazia, um, how many days a week are required to prepare for an interview? Um, I've written a post on this one as well, um, uh, uh, but um, look, it's it's an interesting question because there's like a there's a glib, superficial answer to it. Then there's the kind of well, it's complicated answer. Um, look, uh, what I would say is um, that if you want a sort of a, just a general off the cuff recommendation, I would give yourself a few months. Um, and some people have that advantage, particularly around annual medical recruitment, um, that they know that an interview is coming up in, a, you know, in June or something like that. You know, the more time you give yourself, the better, obviously. There's a point where you lose momentum. Um, I would say, regardless of when you know an interview is coming up, do some initial research and preparation and do a proper practice session um, as soon as possible just to get in the frame of mind. Um, a lot of times when people do coaching with me, the, the first session we have is usually their first ever session doing practice interviews. And it's almost as if that's forcing them to get into practice, they've sort of been avoiding it. Um, so, you know, regardless of how long away it is, do a session now, at least one. Um, then it's about whether you're gonna use a coach, whether you're gonna use another expert, whether you're gonna do it yourself, etc. But I recommend, you know, in the month or so coming up to an interview, at least a couple of preparation sessions per week is good. But that's kind of the um, the superficial answer. The more you, the more technical and coach based answer is, you need to be practicing different aspects of the process, um, and you need to be engaging with things like immediate feedback concepts and deliberative practice. And by that, what I mean things like video you can actually record yourself and see how you come across and don't do a full 45 minute interview just choose one question answer that question watch it back see what happens see where you can improve even answer the first bit of that question um 
In one of my training webinars, I talk about how getting the first question right is almost the most crucial one. And you can literally actually practice the process of coming into a room and sitting down and starting to answer a question um, because getting back to that idea that you want to get the first 90 seconds uh, right as well from a bias point of view is important. So if you just practice questions, at a certain point, fairly quickly in the process, you're going to get bored because you just kind of feel like you've been answering enough questions. That's not where you need to get at. Um, sure, practice a question. When you get bored of that question, move on to another question. But actually practice aspects of the question. Practice what you're going to say, how you're going to structure it, how you're going to signpost it, all those sort of things. Get some feedback. Um, Repractice small elements. This is what high-performance athletes do. They don't just do like, the, you know, a, a, um, a golfer doesn't go out and just do... 18 holes of golf and then think, well, what can I improve next time? No, they sit there and they practice not even their swing sometimes, but just the uplift of their swing, that sort of thing. And they're using video and they're using coaches and all those sort of things to get better. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers the, the question about how much, much time, as much time as possible is good. Uh, there is a possibility that you kind of get a bit exhausted. If you're focusing on improving certain aspects, um, and that's better um, because you'll keep having new things to improve. The other thing is pick the hardest bits of the interview process because um, getting better at the hardest bit can help you to generalize to, to the other bits as well. Um, do they ask things like, what are your weaknesses? Um, yes, they can do, uh, and you need to be prepared to have an answer for that. Um, again, in my um, course, we go through that particular question. Um, people got to ask me, what's in the course? Um, you can quickly run through it. People can do it in a day. Um, so that's one thing, but there's lots of content. Um, I go through a bunch of questions, a bunch of frameworks. There's over two and a half hours worth of video content from me taking you through examples. Um, and we cover that question. And and, um, and I'm always adding new things into that course as well. If people say, well, I, you're not covering this question, well, I'll, I'll go and go off and do that. Um, Shazia, how's the COVID situation going to impact IMG recruitment? Sounds like you hopped on a bit later. I covered that early. Um, what I'm saying at the moment is I haven't seen any big signs about there being an increased interest in IMG recruitment, but there are signs about health services thinking about how they can bring in other workforce like retired doctors, repurposing medical students. Uh, at a certain point, they're going to switch on to the fact that there are several thousand IMGs in this country who aren't employed. Uh, and they're going to think about ways of getting them in. Maybe as a doctor, maybe in other quasi roles. I would, you know, obviously you need to look after yourselves and stay safe. That's the first thing. Um, but if you feel a duty, um, I think there's going to be some opportunities there. And I would look to any opportunity you can have. Anything you do in this COVID era um, in another year's time is going to make you more employable, in my opinion, uh, from a... Uh, a health service perspective. We're hoping that this doesn't create massive disruption or lead to things like loss of life. But let's say we, we do have to find several more doctors next year because of illness and death. Um, you know, we're going to again look to the IMG workforce to as a way to to help with that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, um, it, it, you can see the early signs. A, a lot of this was about saying, well, what can you do now? to get yourself ready for some of those opportunities coming up. So hopefully that helps with your question. Um, so that's a video interview. Go back and watch my video about the video interview. Um, as I said, I'm happy to take some other questions. Uh, the special offer is out there. I think a couple of people have bought it while they've been watching. Um, uh, it's available very briefly for the next hour and a half. If you go and click on the link in the description below. Um, I've cut it back to from 200 bucks worth from 397 to 197 just for you guys that have taken the time to, to watch the watch the, the, um, the live stream so thank you for that um, and happy to take any other questions uh, I'll see if there's a few more questions uh, and then I might just watch switch over to the internet just to show you those things I wanted to show you um, and I have to work out how to do that <laughs> So while I'm waiting for other questions, um, hmm. 
That's funny. Sorry, guys. I know I know, now I need to keep talking. I'm just going to quit that. Um, yeah, any other questions that I can answer for you at this point in time? I cannot get out of PowerPoint. There we go. Um, so let's, well, I'm waiting to see if there are any more. Um, I'm just going to drag across my browser. So it looks like you guys can't see it. So I have to work out how we get that going. Um, Oh, that's why. Okay, entire screen. No, I want the other screen. Uh... Should you go to the hospital in person to apply for jobs? Not right now. Um, as I said, I think one of the things that's changed in this situation is probably you need to be looking a bit more online. Um, and... Uh, you know, normally networking is the way to go, but with social distancing, that's going to be a bit of a problem. Uh, so uh, I would suggest not at the moment. If you're looking online, maybe sending in your expression of interest. Uh, I showed you um, uh, uh, just I showed you a few places that you can go to look. Um, hey, Tejas, thanks uh, for the feedback there. Um, so let me see if this, nope, primary display. Ah, there we go. Um, so um, this was the, the post I was referring to. Um, Google, it's, if you Google that, top 16 resident medical officer questions, uh, it'll come up. Um, but look, uh, these, this takes you through the kind of common questions that uh, get asked of um, gen just all RMOs, really going for general RMO positions, but often with the ING RMOs. So, you know, tell us about your experience. Um, you know, why do you want the job? That sort of thing. How you deal with conflict. Um, errors. Definitely need to have an example of an error. Uh, your strengths, weaknesses. So there's answering that question about strengths and weaknesses. Um, I forget who brought that one up, Shazia, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as I said, um, Shazia, I pointed this out before. Um, on Queensland Health Jobs, uh, they've got an expression of interest at the moment for health professionals, um, including doctors. Uh, currently, you need to have current registration. I would just be watching that to see if they open it up a little bit. Um, this is the New South Wales job board, e-recruit. Um, it's a good place to look. It's the, there are state and territory jobs boards that you need to be looking at as well as, um, seek, um, plug in eligible for registration. Look at the jobs that are there. Um, this would be one that might accept you. Uh, I haven't looked at it. Um, St. John, I've got a looking for people. Um, that's a private hospital. Um, VMO is that consultant level, so probably not applicable. Here's a, here's a resident medical officer job, but that is a recruitment company. Um, so China has a pretty good, so it's probably a genuine opportunity. But just be aware that sometimes it's trying to get a list of people. So just check with them whether there's an actual job at the end of it. Um, and... Um, Going to change that to current application. Just get rid of that. Um, and and um, that's pretty much. Oh, I wanted to go back here and just show. So if you search on New South Wales JMA Recruit, you'll see a whole bunch of jobs pop up. Um, there are some that you should look at, like these RMO jobs. Um, so what you can do is filter it down to um, either by specialty position. I, I recommend starting at resident medical officer, then look at the seniors. Um, sometimes it might be something in the unaccredited trainee, but if we look at resident medical officer, um, there's three there at the moment. Again, I'd be expecting this might expand. If you dig into the details, the only one that actually uh, has the magic words, this one at Lismore, uh, eligible for registration. Um, so that's something else to look at. 
Um, what else can I tell you guys? Probably that's about it. Um, thank you for joining me. Uh, I've got a few other things to get to. I'll see if there's a few more questions before I hop off. And um, uh, if not, uh, hopefully you guys stay safe. As I said, that um, the offer is there. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up. No. Uh, to uh, interview. No. Applications, maybe. No, I'll have to, have to grab it from somewhere else. But... Um, yeah, if you're looking for some help, um, go and grab those two courses that are that I recommended to you. And um, uh, I guess the other thing to say, as I mentioned this earlier on, um, uh, I do do a lot of coaching. And that's often what people seek me out for with help with these things. Um, I, in terms of future predictions, I'm not really sure how much I can sustain that over the next little while. I've got lots of other commitments. Um, so I certainly will stay committed to those people who have engaged me as a coach. That will be my priority over the next little while or ask me to do other things to help them. Um, but I'm just signaling that maybe my availability to do one-on-one -on -one stuff is going to be a lot more limited over the next little while. Um, so what I'm going to focus on is trying to get those courses as good as possible, um, hopefully get that resume course out in the next month or so. Um, it will help me if you guys support me by buying some of those things uh, and using them and giving me some feedback on improvement but i think the best way i can teach some of the stuff that i teach is through that that's a more efficient way of doing it obviously try and keep up some of the videos if i can and the blog posting i hope to be sort of keeping you guys uh, in the loop about where i'm headed and providing more content and helpful information um uh and, and you know hopefully be able to do still do a bit of coaching but uh, I've got to be honest here and say, look, I, I think my ability to do that in particular is going to be limited over the next while. So, again, if you're looking for some help and assistance from me, I would heavily, strongly suggest you go for the um, those courses first. Uh, and then I'll probably mean if you do, say, do the interview skills course and you want some more coaching, you might only need one session at the end of it. Uh, so, finally, Deepu, question. I heard... Um, uh, I heard your um, view of being tech savvy. How important is it to buy a laptop and work on it? Uh, do you recommend investing Microsoft Surface? Should uh, I do some course to make myself comfortable in Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel? How important is touch typing? Should I learn it? Okay, let's unpack that. Um, firstly, I use Win I use Mac, so I can't really comment on <laughs> Microsoft products other than the ones I use within the Mac ecosystem um, or the Apple ecosystem. I hear that Microsoft surfaces are pretty good and almost just, you know, almost like a laptop. Um, I, I definitely think whatever you use for your video interview, make sure it's got, you know, it's most, most of the modern things, tablets, laptops, um, desktops are pretty good from a camera point of view. Sometimes the microphones are a bit, you know, you might need to add a mic. I've got a, I put this in my video. Uh, so I recommend that I just muted that for a sec, I think. So just tell me you can still hear me, but get a Blue Yeti or something like that if your microphone's not good. Um, uh, other than that, the, the thing, I th other than that, I think the thing with your laptops, your iPads, etc., cetera, um, make sure they're in a position uh, where you get that eye level and it's a good frame. Um, don't be sitting there with your phone let me get the phone out um and sort of be trying to interview that way you know um that's not going to work um um uh you know get if it's a tablet see if you can fix it on the wall or somewhere or get a stand or something so you're not holding it um you want to be able to sort of have it not moving um there's nothing worse than doing a selfie interview that's going to be really bad um yeah, look, in the hospitals, you definitely need to know how to do like a Word document and a spreadsheet and things like that. Uh, they expect that level. Um, and yeah, touch typing, I think, is important. A lot of the systems aren't really voice um, dictating yet. Uh, some of them are quite slow. They're kind of still on, you know, old operating software that 
that you often get frustrated because you're like typing and it's not keeping up with you. Um, there's some tricks around that one, one of which is to actually type your thing up somewhere else and then cut and paste it in. Um, so yeah, definitely probably need to get to that level of proficiency. So if you're, if you're feeling that IT behind, again, if you're sort of stuck at home at the moment, you can probably do a few courses on some of that stuff. Hopefully that helps you. Um, so look, if there's no more questions, um, I've had a few text messages while I've been online. Um, so I need to get, so make sure I'm not needed for something else urgent. But again, hopefully that helps. Um, I'll probably re-edit this and put this up on Friday. I don't think I can do another video this week. Um, thank you for supporting the channel and Advanced Med. Um, as I said, I recommend those courses. I've put my heart and soul into them. They are really good courses. Um, stay safe for now and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.